To open 1976, former undisputed champion George Foreman took on Ron Lyle at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, Nevada. The venue would come to be known as the home of champions. Boxing fans have long wondered what could have come of a slugfest between killers George Foreman and Ernie Shavers. This bout, which can only be referred to as a home run derby, serves as a mirror of sorts for the what if battle. On January 24th, in a fight that I personally bill as Godzilla vs. King Kong, arguably the most entertaining, action-packed fight of all time took place. Lau made it very clear that he didn't fear Foreman, though Big George didn't budge in his intimidation tactics. The stare-down was so tense that it still radiates through the screen to this day. The fight began with the wildest right hand you'll see in a professional boxing match as Lyle threw himself at Foreman, amateur style. The fight saw the two trading power punches the entire way, with both men crashing to the canvas on multiple occasions. However, it would be the will of George Foreman that would prevail in the fifth round when he viciously finished a gas Lyle. Howard Cosell managed to make this event even better with his colorful commentary that told the story like no other. The fourth round saw Lau drop Foreman. Foreman stormed back to drop Lau, and then Lau dropped Foreman again in the closing 10 seconds of the round. Foreman showed he had maybe the greatest heart in the division when he answered the knockdown at the end of that round. Foreman came into the fifth and ended matters with 20-something unanswered punches that sent Lyle crashing to the canvas in the same manner that Lyle had sent Shavers crashing down the previous year. It was a fifth round knockout for Big George Foreman in a battle of blood, guts, and will. Foreman, even in his heel persona of the time, gave Ron Lyle credit. And all of this after he'd verbally brushed Lyle aside the previous year during his five-man match in Toronto. This fight is the heavyweight version of Hagler vs. Hearns, or rather the inverse is true, as this fight happened first. It's a real-life Rocky fight that set the bar way too high for expected action in a bout. It will almost certainly never be topped. The foreman stated years later that Ron Lyle was one of the three men who hit him the hardest, along with Jerry Cooney and Cleveland Williams. Foreman's image certainly took a positive turn here as he continued his trek back to the heavyweight championship, his trek back to Muhammad Ali. In his return to the ring for the first time since the Thrilla in Manila, world champion Muhammad Ali made five rounds work of Jean-Pierre Michael Koopman, knocking him out in the fifth. It was Ali's fifth title defense and his 50th win as a professional. Quite the milestone. This remains the first and only heavyweight title bout ever held in Puerto Rico. Does Ali look any different to you in this one? Like the thrill in Manila definitely took a lot out of him? You tell me. The champ would return to the ring in two short months. On April 30th at the Capitol Center in Landover, Maryland, undisputed world champion Muhammad Ali faced off against top-ranked contender Jimmy Young in a battle of similar styles. Like Ali, Young was a defensive counterpuncher who liked to stick and sting from range. It was the old master up against the new student. According to CompuBox, Young outlanded Ali on higher volume and percentage across 15 rounds, including jabs and power punches. However, whenever Ali would apply the pressure to Young and get serious, Young ducked outside of the ropes. The referee counted the 12th round duck as a knockdown and began counting, to which Young returned to the ring at the count of two. Whenever Ali took the initiative as the dancing master, he was controlling the action. But when he stood flat-footed, Young was more so in the driver's seat. Ken Norton, who had scored a fifth round TKO earlier in the night against Ron Stander, was present and barking at Ali to get it together. Norton said that Ali looked pitiful on the night, but knew that his rival would be adequately prepared for their coming title bout later in the year. Despite this all, 
Muhammad Ali won by unanimous decision over Jimmy Young. It was his fifth title defense. On May 22nd, tragedy once again struck the boxing world with the death of longtime contender Oscar Bonavina. Since losing to Ron Lyle in 1974, Ringo was on an undefeated trail. At Mustang Ranch near Reno, Nevada, Bonavina was shot dead by a security guard after Oscar had come into conflict with the owner. He was only 33 years old. His body was returned to his home country of Argentina where he was buried at La Chacarita Cemetery in Buenos Aires. He finished his career with a record of 58 wins, 9 losses, and 1 draw. Rest in peace to one of the best fighters who never won the big one. In what would be his final knockout victory, Muhammad Ali bounced the courageous Richard Dunn off the canvas five times, thrice in the fourth and another two times in the fifth, where the fight was stopped, despite Dunn's continuing to advance forward through the referee's grasp. Ali was winding up his right for the kill in true character and form. Perhaps... The last time Ali looked like Superman. It had been three years since the Sunshine Showdown, and much had changed for former champions Big George Foreman and Smokin' Joe Frazier. The Invincible Foreman had been nerfed to size, and Frazier was the victim of a bitter comeback. The common denominator, of course, was the great Muhammad Ali. Foreman and Frazier agreed to fight for the NABF title that Foreman had just won against Ron Lyle earlier in the year. Now on the surface, you'd think both men were gunning for a shot at the champ Ali, but it was deeper than that. While Foreman was indeed borderline lusting for a rematch with Ali, Frazier had just come off of the thrill in Manila and was more so focused on avenging his embarrassing loss to George Foreman. On June 15th at Nassau Veterans Memorial Coliseum in Uniondale, New York, the Day of Destiny was on. Frazier shocked everyone when he revealed he'd shaved his head in his dressing room just before the fight. The stare down was scary, just as the last one was, and the action would prove different this time. Whereas Joe was known for his smothering aggressive pressure, this time he came out with a more cautious and defensive style. Frazier looked to peck away at George from the outside while using a random rhythm of head movement. Frazier was also taunting Foreman to land a punch and frustrating him perhaps utilizing the tactic Ali did in Zaire. It all worked initially, but the aging ex-champion couldn't keep the pace up forever. Foreman was also beginning to better time Frazier, and the fight devolved into a mirror of what had happened three years earlier. Remember, too, that Foreman said he'd knock Frazier out again back in 1975. Foreman took control of the fight by focusing on Frazier's body and managed to deck Smokin' Joe in the fifth, sending him to the canvas. Frazier answered the count and was sent back to the canvas almost immediately. Eddie Futch stepped in and stopped the fight on his fighter's behalf, and George Foreman had secured a fifth-round technical knockout over Joe Frazier, further cementing that what had happened in Jamaica was no fluke. Foreman was looking deadly good on his comeback trail now and appeared to be etching ever closer to a rematch with the aging undisputed champion but there was still a ways to go down the road for the former champion. This would be the last fight for Smokin' Joe Frazier in the 70s, as he would take a five-year layoff from the sport. The illustrious career of Joe Frazier had wound down, as was expected for a fighter who utilized his style. He may not have avenged his losses to rivals Ali and Foreman, but he never went out without a fight and proved himself to be perhaps the gutsiest fighter to ever lace up the gloves.
In a truly bizarre event that saw boxing and professional wrestling crossover, two boxer versus wrestler matches took place. The first was Andre the Giant versus Chuck Wepner, and the latter was Muhammad Ali versus Antonio Inoki. The latter match took place in Japan at the Nippon Budokan Arena in Tokyo, while the rest of the event took place at Shea Stadium in Flushing, New York. Chuck Webner lost his match to Andre the Giant when he failed to answer the count after being thrown out of the ring. Webner's match against Andre may have inspired a portion of Rocky III, where Rocky fights the wrestler Thunderlips and is similarly thrown out of the ring. Ali and Inoki's match was specifically billed as the war between the worlds. The bout saw Ali land only two jabs as Inoki lie flat on his back and kick Ali in the legs. The kicks caused two blood clots and an infection that almost led to Ali's leg being amputated. The fight was called a draw. Ali and Inoki became good friends after the event, with Ali flying out in 1998 to see Inoki's last match before his retirement. Strangely enough, the event is seen today as a precursor to the growing popularity of mixed martial arts. Inoki's student went on to found Pancrease, which inspired the founding of Pride Fighting Championships, who were acquired by the UFC in 2007. This event wouldn't be the last time that Ali collaborated with the world of professional wrestling. At the 1976 Olympic Boxing Heavyweight Program, gold medalist Teofilo Stevenson repeated when he once again brought the gold home for Cuba in a win over Romania's Mircha Simon. Stevenson was offered $5 million to come straight out of the Olympics into a championship match against Muhammad Ali, but declined, stating that the love of his people was worth more than the money. Stevenson would go on to win a third gold medal at the 1980 Olympics and may have won an unprecedented fourth and fifth in 84 and 88 if the Soviet Union hadn't boycotted the games, which Cuba followed suit as they were allies. As consolation, Stevenson did score a win over eventual gold medalist Tyrell Biggs. The Cuban legend passed away on June 11, 2012. We can only wonder how a professional berth would have turned out for the Olympic 3 P champion. Rest in peace, champ. On the subject of the Olympics, Leon Spinks won gold at light heavyweight and his brother Michael Spinks won gold at middleweight. The Spinks brothers were on course to make waves in the heavyweight division in the coming years. Continuing his demolition derby under the cloud of the rumble in the jungle, George Foreman stopped Scott Little in three rounds, becoming the first man to drop Little. As was usual with Foreman in the Golden Age, it was brutal and vicious, as Foreman showed no restraint. On September 28th at Yankee Stadium in the Bronx, New York, reigning and defending undisputed heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali put his crown on the line against rival Ken Norton in the finale of their heavyweight trilogy. The fight saw Norton ultimately outland Ali, according to CompuBox, but observing the fight showed it to be as even as the first two, once again coming down to the final round. Norton's corner, who felt he was well enough ahead, suggested he fight cautiously in the final round, despite Norton never having been in any trouble at the hands of Ali's power. Ali took the initiative in the final round and ultimately won the war against Norton in his sixth title defense, but the manner by which he won the fight is disputed to this day. There are fight fans who argue for the fight to have gone either way, but what can't be argued is that the fight was a unanimous decision win for Ali. Ali would later say that even he felt Norton edged it out that night. The Ali-Norton rivalry had ended the same way it started. An even fight had ended in an upset as the fans booed the decision for Ali and Norton broke down crying. Ken considered retiring after the bout and maintained that he had won that fight. He would never again trust boxing judges. This bout would end up as the last boxing match to take place in the famous Yankee Stadium before its demolition 34 years later. With this win, Muhammad Ali 
had won the rivalries against the two men who'd beaten him and that could be considered his kryptonite style-wise. The legend of Muhammad Ali had become self-sustaining. Big Mean George was back and this time with an easy mode TKO over John Dino Dennis. Foreman battered Dennis bloody. What'd you expect, an upset? However, Foreman did credit Dennis for daring to trade with him and was humble when asked if he rated himself as the top heavyweight. Foreman also credited God for making everything possible for him. His personality change was noted and foretelling of the man he would become. Foreman also made it clear that this was his comeback trail and he had only one goal that mattered, avenging his loss to you know who and regaining the heavyweight title. A battle more so significant in hindsight given the future would hold much opportunity for both of these South African fighters. Harry Kutsia took Kali Kanutsa's O with a 10 round decision, establishing he was superior for the time being. But would the aforementioned future maintain said standing? You'll have to wait till things heat up big time in 1979 when we check back in with both sluggers. On November 21st, one of the most important movies in modern history was released, A True Cinderella Story, with an equally compelling backstory from writer and creator Sylvester Stallone. As was mentioned earlier, the Ali Wepner fight was the inspiration for Sly Stallone to write a story about the human will and going the distance in life. It went on to win Best Picture, two other Academy Awards, and was nominated for 10 it is considered to be one of, if not the greatest sports movies of all time. As for the best boxing film, it's between this and Raging Bull, which will be released in 1980. Rocky may also be the best Thanksgiving film ever made. Rocky tells the story of a 30-year-old nobody, Rocky Balboa from Philly. He works as a debt collector for a loan shark and also boxes. The opportunity of a lifetime comes for Rocky when champion Apollo Creed selects him as the replacement for his injured opponent. As great as the fight is, the film is made by the varying characters and how they interact with one another. It's warm, genuine, and humble. You know Rocky doesn't really have a chance against Creed, or does he? In the end, it was never about winning. It was about going the distance and proving yourself a message that has resonated with viewers over 40 years later. The unlikely success of this rags to riches story would propel the career of Sylvester Stallone and birth a legendary franchise. Even more impressive is that the movies continue to be well made and executed with the exception of the fifth film and even that's debatable considering the work print of Rocky V. Rocky was made on a budget of $1.1 million and grossed $225 million. That would be akin to a latter-day $4 million movie making $1 billion in returns. Stallone insisted that he star in the film and was paid a total of $1 because the producers didn't trust him with the role. He bet on himself and it more than paid off. To conclude 1976, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. That's three straight now with the greatest exits of year rating supreme. It was a rough one with some questionable calls, but Ali remains atop the mountain. Still, contenders were not just going to lie down 
and would continue coming on hard against the fading center of gravity, Muhammad Ali. Some near misses on the year with both Jimmy Young and Ken Norton coming close to dethroning Muhammad Ali. I'm going to give the award to George Foreman for scraping himself off the canvas twice to battle back and brutalize Ron Lyle to oblivion. That fight will never be topped. Though Fury Wilder 3 was a nice effort. The ring's round of the year was a tie between the fourth and fifth rounds of Foreman and Lyle. The ring's fight of the year was the Foreman Lyle barroom brawl. The ring's fighter of the year was the beast on the comeback trail, Big George Foreman. On September 27th, Trevor Burbick debuted with a fifth round tactical knockout win. On October 2nd, Dwayne Bobbick stopped Chuck Wepner on cuts, moving to 37-0. Along the way, Bobbick beat Scott Ledoux and future champion Mike Weaver with most of his wins coming by stoppage. He would ascend to one more victory before taking his first real leap in opponent quality in the coming 1977. On October 15th, Michael Dokes debuted with a two-round rep stoppage win. He dropped his opponent, Al Bird, twice before the stoppage on cuts. Ernie Shavers won all three of his bouts on the year and had also won the rebound fight after the Lyle loss just two months after. He was heading into 1977 with strong momentum en route to his big break. Finally returning from his exile, George Foreman badly wanted the Muhammad Ali rematch, but it would never come to be. Foreman would only fight four more times in the 1970s. Joe Frazier's five-year layoff concluded with his return in 1981, in which he fought to a draw. That was his last match, and Smoke and Joe retired to his Philadelphia gym, where he would focus on overseeing the career of his son, Marvis. Larry Holmes won all four of his bouts on the year, the hardest of which was against Roy Williams. Williams had settled a dispute over money with Ali in a 10-round gym war, which was allegedly one of Ali's toughest fights. Holmes was more than ready for the bout against Williams. Muhammad Ali was still on top of the division, but the signs of his deteriorating health were becoming ever more evident. Frazier was gone, and Foreman was on his way out, despite the hunt for a rematch. Who would be brave enough to tell the champ it was time to hang it all 